Hello, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> okay. So I bet that when you woke up this morning, you didn't think that evolutionary biology had anything to do with um, food waste. Hear me out for a second. You see, every day for me is dealing with equations, with computer code, and with simulations. I try to find out why animals behave and are the way they are. Is it because they explore their particular environment? Is it because they go out for food at a particular point in time? So, my question is, what happens to these niches? What happens to these spaces where animals make their living? I can tell you that there's countless species out there to exploit the most marginal and the most intricate niches, imagine, um, niches in, in their environment. And they form these tightly coupled ecosystems where nothing is left to waste. Or society, on the other hand, is not there yet. Food waste is a big issue. And it's a big issue because in order to produce food, you consume energy, water, human resources. So taking all that and chugging it into a bin is, is not cheap. So let's talk some numbers. In the UK, there's around 50 million tons of food surplus that are wasted every single year. That, that number, which is not there for some reason, <laughs> That number is actually a third of what we, as consumers, buy. So a third of what you buy at, at your shop is just thrown away from the point of production to storage and consumption. Now, 50% of these 50 million tons is what we call household waste. And this is the sort of waste that, you know, typical scenario where you buy a lot of food and you don't get to eat it at the end of the day, or perhaps you don't like the particular part of the pepper, a particular part of the cucumber, and you just throw it away. The other 50% is the niche I'm interested in, and this is the surplus niche. These are leaks that happen from production to transportation to storage. So imagine that Jamie Oliver, this week, teaches you how to do a pineapple tart where you caramelize onions, something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's quite odd. So shops essentially use this information to, to ship to their stores a particular quantity of, of pineapples for this week. And at the end of the week, there's going to be pineapples left, sometimes. So why is there pineapples left? Doesn't the store want to be super efficient? Well, the reason is that the potential profits that they could make from selling that extra pineapple justifies the risk not to. Where does this surplus end up? Well. Some of them ends up in food banks, and is transported by food charities that um, give it to catering services. But fruit is really hard to handle, and fresh products is really hard to handle. And people that use food banks tend to go for more longer-lasting alternatives, like um, canned foods and pasta and rice. So eventually, all this fruit just trickles down to the landfill. But what if we could extend the lifespan of this food what if we could add another six months? Remember that at the point this food is considered overstocked. Simply, you know, it's, it's in perfect condition, but it's just in the, right, in the wrong place at the wrong time. But more importantly, it has no time left. So extending its life is a big deal. A year ago, with the help of Professor Pathik Pathak, who is a lecturer in social enterprise here at university, I had an idea that I introduced to him. This idea turned into Bigastry. Bigastry is a charity that intends to establish a network of dehydration centers around the UK. Centers where we can take these fruit and vegetables and turn it into commercially viable products. At the moment, the idea that we're handling is creating a consumer product with a brand, sort of like a fruit snack. Or, for instance, dehydrating fruit and giving it away to industries and businesses that can mix it to form granolas. Or perhaps even to restaurants that can use it uh, directly into the recipes. Other options are veggie powder, which happens to be, I discovered doing my research, that it happens to be a nutritional supplement, natural nutritional supplement. As a last resource, we can turn this food into animal feed. Now, the thing is that once you take water out, you manage to stop the clock. And then a range of commercial opportunities open in front of you. So, Bigastry wants to patch this leak. 
He wants to solve this issue, he wants to fill this niche in society. But we don't stop there. We're concerned with another leak. It's a leak of human potential that is caused by food poverty. Between one million and four million people every single year depend to some extent on food banks. The dichotomy created by a system that has tons of food surplus and at the same time has millions of people in need of it is quite shameful. So our intention in Bigastry is to redirect all profits into charities that deal with food poverty and food sustainability. We want to grow, obviously. We will do some internal investment. But our final goal is to create a black box of sustainability, a black box that has employment opportunities inside of it and that turns surplus food into social capital, into social benefit. We believe that we achieve that. And at the moment, the issues that we are having have to do with finding suitable kitchen space uh, that can be used very sporadically and solving the issue of erratic input of fruit and the necessity to create a constant output of product. We're solving this issue with the help of some, par some partners like Pay As You Feel Cafes and Fair Share, who is a hub charity that gathers fruit and food surplus and redistributes it around. Now, if there's anything you can take away from this talk is that there's still room for these sort of uh, enterprises, these sort of projects, these sort of perhaps businesses if you want to take that approach. There's room for uh, a society where we have organizations that makes it a little bit more efficient, a little bit more sustainable, but perhaps more importantly, a little bit more compassionate. Thank you very much for your time.